Good evening and a very warm welcome to all of you to this evening's edition of Healing Our Minds. Healing Our Minds is a series aimed at bringing forth multidisciplinary and multi-faith reflections on the human condition so that we can together find better ways to engage with our struggles, our troubles, our disappointments, or dukkha, as Buddhism refers to it. Struggles and troubles come in all forms and uh, sizes. Uh, tonight, my particular struggle is with my internet connection. So my apologies if you know it lags or, or anything like that. To find a solution for tonight, we're turning to uh, the Vedanta. And we are uh, honored to have with us today, Swami Sarva Priyananda, who is the minister and spiritual leader of the Vedanta Society of New York since January 2017. He was a Nagra fellow at the Harvard Divinity School in 2019-20. Swamiji has played a prominent role in organizing and participating in various interfaith panels and seminars, including speaking at the World Parliament of Religions in Toronto in 2018 and at the United Nations headquarters in New York. A compelling speaker, his abiding passions for the, for the Upanishads and psychology have led to a collection of ebooks, which are now available on Amazon Kindle. With him in conversation will be Mr. Rajiv Mehrutra, who is the honorary managing trustee of the Foundation for Universal Responsibility of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. A longtime student of His Holiness, he is also an author, and his books are available in more than 50 languages and editions. Over to Rajiv. Thank you, Aparna. Uh, Pranam Swamiji, I am uh, deeply blessed uh, several times over uh, to be uh, you know, here to, uh, in, my, uh, in my sort of, how do I put this, uh, as a seeker, uh, you know, to learn from you. Uh, I, I must uh, uh, so say a few, few personal words. Uh, you know, celebrating uh, the Ramakrishna order uh, and, and the Vedanta tradition that you represent here uh, with my own, uh, you know, connect with it. I was uh, deeply blessed and privileged uh, to have been uh, a student of Swami Ranganathananji Maharaj, and from whom I uh, received uh, Diksha. And uh, I, I say this because in these extremely fractured times, uh, uh, people often ask me that, well, I mean, you continue to uh, have great loyalty and affection uh, to the Ramakrishna mission, and yet you are a student uh, of the Dalai Lama and manage one of his institutions. And I think it is a great tribute, really, to both. Uh, and uh, one of the great joys and pleasures of my life uh, and great learnings of my life that my first teacher and my now root guru, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, um, became good friends. And I was able to have the great breath, the blessing and privilege to moderate a conversation between them. And uh, His Holiness visited uh, Belur and they stayed in touch. And I think that was a, a great uh, testimony uh, to both uh, the Ramakrishna mission and of course His Holiness who has acknowledged, uh, and I remember at the Vivekananda uh, centenary celebrations, uh, he talked about his great debt to Thakur Sri Ramakrishna, uh, who had uh, in his own lifetime, uh, you know, being an avatar, uh, engaged in the various rituals and practices of the diversity of Hinduism, but also of Islam and Christianity. So I think these are two crucial pillars uh, of my life. And I think demonstrating of the, 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 the discourse that our planet so sorely needs and the spirit in which uh, we have been uh, organizing uh, these fortnightly Friday evening talks uh, to learn from each other and to send out the message that um, of uh, inclusiveness and not merely tolerance, but celebrating diversity. So, uh, and you, uh, in honor that spirit uh, so very eloquently. And you're now sort of head of the Vedanta Center, uh, like, of course, in all of the Ramakrishna mission, but it was this Vedanta Center that Swami Vivekananda himself uh, established 
during his visit uh, to the United States. So you are part of a very hallowed lineage. Um, it is a deep privilege uh, on behalf of the Foundation of His Holiness the Dalai Lama to welcome you here this evening. Um, I'm going to just, you know, I'm going to plunge in to the aspiration of this talk uh, and, and, and our conversation this evening, which really is that a time of, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're having this conversation and meeting together uh, in the shadow of a terrible war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we are barely, uh, you know, recovering from COVID. Uh, the uh, rates of depression and anxiety have soared, and not only from our personal lived experience, uh, but what is happening around us in these cataclysmic times. Uh, so as a sadhaka, I mean, I would come up to you and say, uh, Swamiji, I am lost, I am bewildered, I don't sleep at night, I experience anxiety, uh, and, and um, I really don't know how to uh, deal with this and, and cope with it. And so what advice would you give me? I mean, we'll go into the larger picture, but right now, this is the pressing question that many of us confront. Thank you, Rajivji, and uh, thank you for having me uh, on this program. Uh, I'll just uh, take this opportunity to say that today is actually auspicious. It is the birthday of Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, so 4th of March this year uh, in the Indian calendar would be the birthday of Sri Ramakrishna. And uh, your special association with uh, the Ramakrishna order, with, especially with uh, revered Swami Ranganathanandaji, I remember the first time I came to know about you was watching you interview. Uh, Swami Ranganathanandaji many years ago. Uh, so that interview is actually available on, on YouTube. If you, if you, go, if you search for uh, Raji Marotra, Swami Ranganathanandaji, you'll get that interview. Um, there's a personal connection there too for me because uh, I was initiated into sannyasa by revered Swami Ranganathanandaji Maharaj. Yes. So these are the two great traditions uh, uh, which are sort of foundational for India's uh, very ancient and very rich spiritual heritage, uh, Buddhism and uh, uh, Hinduism. Of course, with another very ancient tradition, uh, Jainism, uh, and a much more modern tradition, uh, Sikhism. Now, I, you know, the question about what can we do from a spiritual perspective to confront uh, these huge challenges, the COVID challenge, which hopefully we are emerging from now, and immediately you're hit with uh, this new uh, crisis. So what can spirituality do? I think the Buddha, uh, he explained it beautifully. What can spirituality do? What, what is it meant for? Um, so the story goes that uh, one of the bhikshus, one of the uh, monks, asked the Buddha. But you know, you told us that the nature of suffering is old age, disease, death. And then you are looking for a solution to that suffering. And I suppose you have found it and that's what you're teaching us. And yet uh, we are uh, all getting old. <laughs> the, the old age is coming for us, disease is coming for us and inevitably death as we are. So you are too, you the Buddha, you're also getting old. <laughs> And we know inevitably uh, Buddha's body succumbed to disease and uh, then he passed. So how is it that you have overcome suffering? Uh, where is the solution for suffering here? Uh, old age, disease and death are still here. And the Buddha's answer was remarkable. He said, the nature of suffering is like a man hit by an arrow and by a second arrow. Uh, the, the first arrow, and just imagine the shock. You're hit by an arrow, the, the pain of it, and, and then immediately you're hit by a second arrow. He says that the first arrow is what the world throws at you, so which is old age, disease, death, war, and COVID, and whatnot. The second arrow is our reaction to it. As you mentioned, the anxiety, the sleeplessness, the uneasiness, uh, the, our reaction to this, this uh, what the world has thrown at us. And then he points out, the Buddha points out, that most of our suffering comes from that second arrow. And, and it's uh, easy to see that. The same problem 
two different people handle it differently. Same disease, same old age, same uh, relationship problems, same economic problems. You'll see different people handle it differently, depending on the quality of the mind. Uh, upon the training of the mind, the reaction is different. And the suffering is also different. So it's a second arrow. Our reaction to the events of the world, what the world throws at, at us, our reaction to the first arrow, that causes maximum suffering. And the Buddha said that what I have taught you uh, will help you to overcome the suffering caused by that second arrow. Not the first one. The first one will continue to happen. You know, like a, a gentleman, he said, I can't do much about the first one. <laughs> so this is the nature of all spirituality. What spirituality can do I mean, what it cannot do is uh, these two arrows and deal with the nature of suffering, which is uh, actually caused by the second one, our reaction to what is happening. I think the challenge, Swamiji, is that uh, yes. uh, we are impatient. And uh, when the uh, second arrow strikes, uh, um, we are already, in a sense, felled and find it very difficult and challenging uh, to get up and uh, prepare for the other second arrows uh, that will follow. And then people would say, well, you know, it's all very well to say this is Maya or Shunya or whatever our philosophical uh, framework uh, you know, tells us, so this is karma. I mean, right now I'm desperate. These arrows are hitting me left, right and center. And uh, you know, you're a minister and you must be getting people. Uh, you know, who are coming in at this time in this sense of desperation. And uh, so, you know, very often we anguish about what is it that we can say and do. I mean, I, I must sort of, uh, as, as, as a suffix, say, of course, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, and, you know, who am I to say you're right? You are. And, and in my limited understanding uh, that it is about uh, training them, training our mind, you know, the Bhagavad Gita tells us that, uh, you know, the mind can be our best friend when kept under control and our worst enemy when we lose it. Or I think Swami Vivekananda compared the restless mind to a monkey that is not only drunk with the wine of desire, but also, second arrow, stung by the scorpion of jealousy and taken over by the demon of pride, etc., etc., etc. But it takes so much hard work uh, to arrive at it. And... Uh, so, I, I mean, this is asking you the impossible. I mean, I, we're asking you for a, an alternative to popping a pill. <laughs> well, yes and no, actually. It does take hard work and sustained effort over a long time. And it does not. I'll tell you how it does and how it does not. Um, first, how, how does it not take long and sustained effort? It's actually, crucially, about a change in our paradigm. Um, the first thing is to recognize that what is happening now uh, is not unique. It has happened in the past, it's happening now, and it will continue to happen in the future. The very nature of this uh, world is suffering. That was the first truth, the first noble truth of, of the Buddha. In the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna says, Prapya imam asukham lokam bhajaswamam. Is having come to this world, and he describes the world as asukam lokam, the unhappy world. So the, somehow the very nature of the world is not conducive to lasting or profound happiness uh, in the way we experience it first, in, the, in our unreflective uh, you know, contact with the world. Um, and the word that Krishna uses, asukam, in Bengali, asuk means illness, which is particularly relevant for this time. <laughs> The, this world of, let's say, illness, not just suffering. Ashuk is illness. And the solution, Sri Krishna says, Bhajaswamam, worship the Lord or worship me in, in the sense of worship the divinity. That means spirituality is the deep solution for this. Now, what is this uh, paradigm shift? What can you do like popping a spiritual pill, which makes a huge difference right away? The central paradigm shift here is, that I do not look to this asukham lokam, this world of misery and unhappiness for fulfillment. It's bound to disappoint me. I make enlightenment my goal. What the Buddha's quest was, what in today's age Vivekananda's quest was, was what transformed Narendra Dutta into Vivekananda. 
that becomes my quest. And it's not too big a thing. You might think, oh, Buddha, Buddha, Vivekananda, uh, it's tremendous beyond our uh, capacity. It isn't. Uh, in fact, in Buddhism, in Jainism, Hinduism, everywhere, moksha, nirvana, or kaivalya, uh, they are all, uh, th th these are actually the goal for all human beings. So it is entirely within, within our, our reach. And in fact, not only should we aim at it, we must aim at it. That's, the, that's seen as, uh, typically it's across these traditions, that's seen as the goal of human life. Now, the moment we do that, that, um, that enlightenment is my goal, moksha, nirvana, God realization, whatever you call it, that is my goal. A, a huge change comes in my perspective. Uh, then I am not looking to this world, to this particular limited life for, uh, you know, for my entire satisfaction. That if things go well for me, then I'll be happy. If everybody treats me nicely all the time, then only I'll be happy. If, but if you state it outright like that, it sounds silly. Uh, but that's somehow our implicit uh, assumption, you know, in our minds that things must really go well for me. Uh, it will not go well for us. Uh, it, it is again the central insight of the of uh, Buddhism that this is a world of continuous change, a world of flux. And notice our happiness when we depend on this world for our happiness, then it depends on a, a particular set of circumstances. My health must be good. I must be young and handsome and beautiful. Uh, and people must be nice to me. And I must be rich. And uh, I must have lots of Facebook likes and so on. There's a whole list of uh, things which must be perfect for me to be happy. But suppose even if I do uh, attain this set of almost impossible parameters for happiness because it's a world of change moment I attain this set of circumstances for happiness it will change so the next moment I'll be unhappy uh, it takes very little to make us unhappy and it takes a lot to make us happy so the, everything might be going very well in this body but if in one tooth I have a toothache then I'll be unhappy, no matter that 99.9% .9 of processes in this body are, are going perfectly well. So the, we recognize this, that the, this world, you cannot go to it with a begging bowl and say, make me happy. It won't work. It's, it's upon a, a fundamentally mistaken assumption about the nature of this world. I think there, Veda, yes. No, no, sorry, please. No, I was first. I think there, yes, uh, go, go on, come on. No, no, you're first. <laughs> okay. So I, I was saying that I think their Vedanta and Buddhism, they have this common understanding of, about the basic nature of this world, and that it cannot give us lasting, deep, profound satisfaction. Once that is recognized, and we recognize that there is a spirit, spiritual solution to the problems of this world, uh, then um, we, uh, this paradigm shift itself, it makes a huge difference in our lives. I remember this professor, uh, Professor Parimal Patil at, at Harvard University. He teaches Indian philosophy uh, at, in Emerson Hall in, at Harvard University. He asked this question related to what you were asking. Why should, he said, let me put a problem to you, Swamiji. Why should anybody engage in spiritual uh, pursuits uh, if it's so difficult, if so few people attain enlightenment? Why should we uh, pursue this? And I said, I'll give you two answers. I gave him two answers and he gave me a third answer. And I'll just put all these three answers before you right now. So the first answer I said, it is uh, not that very few people will get enlightenment. In the big picture, uh, everybody ultimately is going to be enlightened. Because if our very nature is Brahman, what could possibly prevent us or check us from someday? Uh, attaining to uh, the full realization of our, our nature. Um, the second answer I gave was that uh, once you have tasted spiritual life, once you have made this, this very sublime thing your goal, uh, what could compare to it? So no matter how difficult it is or how far it seems, it is so wonderful, uh, so high and noble and sublime, you will pursue it. 
And then he gave a third answer. He said, these two are very good, but they're rather theoretical. The professor said, I'll give you a practical reason why one should pursue this spiritual life. It's because quite apart from that ultimate goal of nirvana, moksha, whatever it is, you get benefits from this day to day um, throughout our lives. And this is what really keeps people on the spiritual path. The regular, the daily benefits of meditation, of scriptural study, of reflection, of devotion, of service. The benefits, you don't have to wait till some ultimate metaphysical goal of um, nirvana or moksha is attained. You get benefits in terms of peace, of meaningful, uh, meaningful existence, uh, of being uh, blessed yourself and being a blessing to others. So yes, this is what I wanted to share. The first thing is this paradigm shift. Uh, who am I? Uh, I am not just this one individual among many buffeted by the uh, ever-changing winds of this uh, ocean of samsara. I am a spiritual seeker. This internal shift. I think almost everybody here, even if they don't put it in these terms, almost everybody who is attending a program like this would have made this choice somewhere, uh, either deliberately or unconsciously have sort of come into this path. Um, yes. So I was going to say that uh, 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 what you're really saying is that uh, if we can uh, recognize the true nature of reality, and uh, the true nature of reality uh, is been sort of covered by a, a veil of ignorance. And so if that veil of ignorance is lifted, then we see the true nature of reality. Uh, the, the, the first arrow that uh, strikes, and then we can reach out uh, to the second arrow. And uh, the, 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 the genius of uh, our heritage, and I think uh, uh, this is what, uh, of course, uh, 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 Tucker was doing uh, through all his sadhanas, was demonstrating the practices that make it possible that it is not enough to be told that this is so, because then that is in the realm of knowledge. It has to move to understanding and realization so that it becomes a reflexive response. Because very often uh, when we are in the sort of, how do I put it, in, 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 in um, the wonderful phrase called spiritual materialism, when we are sort of, you know, drowning in spiritual materialism and the idea of it or the, the image of it or, or the externality of it, um, uh, when confronted with that, uh, that provocation of the second arrow, we panic. And so it is a long uh, process. I mean, there may be payoffs as, you know, on the way uh, that we feel uh, stronger and better. So I, I, I was looking for some, uh, of course, Swamiji has sort of most eloquently, uh, you know, summed up, uh, you know, for our times, uh, you know, the four yogas of, uh, you know, uh, Bhakti yoga, Karma yoga, uh, you know, Raj yoga, et cetera. And uh, so that depending on our mental proclivities, uh, we take different parts and different methods uh, to be able to experience that. And in a sense, that is what uh, the Buddha was doing, that uh, he engaged in the sadhanas of his time, uh, sat down under a tree and engaged in uh, another kind of sadhana, that he saw the true nature of reality, which he then found difficult to articulate. Uh, and one of the great traps uh, for, uh, for, 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 for practitioners is to get stuck with the concepts and without them having translated into the lived experience of the true nature of reality. And so you had uh, the Thakur engaging in the practices that would yield to that. And then Swamiji, who was sort of spreading the message out into the larger world, uh, sort of elegantly I mean, sort of articulated them in these four yogas. So give us a sense of the, uh, the method. Uh, because, you know, like you know, earlier on said, and, you know, philosophically, we can say, well, you know, I understand that uh, everything, you know, uh, so much of the projection of the mind, I understand the problems of the mind, but I don't know what to do. And how do I change this paradigm? And the strength of our civilization and heritage is to provide the methods to do that. You're right. In fact, um, Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda, if not, nothing else, they were very practical uh, spiritual uh, uh, masters. So what mattered to them was how can we actually implement these things in our life, you know, get the benefit of it 
um, right here and, and now, uh, quite apart from the metaphysics and the dialectics of it all. So Swami, as you said, Swami Vivekananda's famous uh, definition of religion, religion is the manifestation of the divinity already within us. And then the methods immediately moves on to the methods. Um, you can do it by uh, philosophy, by which he means jnana yoga, the way of knowledge. You can do it by love, by which he means bhakti yoga, the way of devotion. Uh, or by, he says, by psychic control, which he, by which he means raja yoga or the path of meditation. Uh, and then karma yoga, he says, you can do it by, by service, by, by good works, by uh, altruistic uh, living. Um, or he says, by one or more or all of these, uh, by a combination of all these yogas, and be free. Uh, and he says, this is, all, this is the whole of religion. Books, temples, doctrines, and churches are secondary details. Now let's take, um, I mean, with your permission, we'll dwell on each of these methods a um, little bit in detail. So to get a feel for how they are unique and how they can be combined and straight away in our lives. But again, with the background, what I said earlier is that internal paradigm shift that I, I now internally define myself as a spiritual seeker. Having re realized the nature of this world, now I take up these methods. Uh, otherwise, what happens is, if I'm still a world seeker, a seeker of this material, uh, uh, seeker of satisfaction from materialism, uh, then even these uh, yogas will be pressed into service of materialism. So, having decided that I, I, am, I am now a seeker of enlightenment, of nirvana, whatever it is, uh, then I engage in these practices. So these are broad practices. You will notice at least three of them. The jnana yoga, it is related to the cognitive aspect of uh, our, uh, our psychology, our, the cognitive powers within us, the ability to know and understand. The bhakti yoga, it is related to the affective domain of the hum uh, human psyche, the feelings, the emotions. Uh, and then uh, karma yoga, which is, uh, which is related to the connective, the will, the ability to do something. So we have these powers, the power of knowing, the power of loving, and the power of doing. And they are harnessed. They are now channeled into spiritual life by these methods. Behind it all is the power of yoga or meditation, the power of focus. All right, let's quickly take a look at each of these four uh, aspects. The, let's start with Karma Yoga, which was a special favorite of Swami Vivekananda. What is its answer to our problems? What is it, how is it taking care of that second arrow? And in fact, even the first one. What Karma Yoga says, the basic insight is that uh, uh, work done for others, work done for, um, unselfishly, altruistically, selflessly, uh, is actually um, it leads to a greater sense of well-being, more satisfaction, more happiness than work done selfishly. Now, this is, uh, this is actually counterintuitive. I mean, it seems almost instinctive that if I work for myself, if I earn for myself, if I'm engaged all day long in trying to make this one happy, then that's the way to become happy, isn't it? But, but that doesn't work. Uh, Swami Vivekananda says, is that unselfish, unselfishness is more pain, but it takes a mature mind to understand this. Selflessness is actually leads to um, more satisfaction, more happiness, more peace of mind, rather than working for oneself alone. But it's not e obvious. It needs to be learned in life. Either life teaches us, or if we are wise, when we take these spiritual teachings to heart. So, now, there's a crucial insight here that what Krishna told Arjuna, it does not require a tremendous change in your external life. I mean, do I have to, uh, you know, change my suit of clothes uh, and put on a gerua like a swami and sit in an ashram? Then only am I a, a yogi. Krishna told Arjuna that uh, he, the whole of the Bhagavad Gita is that uh, this philosophy goes to the person in the field of work, uh, uh, the householder who, while remaining a householder and engaged with the world, can become spiritual. That is the, the beauty of the path of karma yoga. So what you do in that, in this path is, 
that the work that we are already doing is now mentally dedicated to God. Uh, if you believe in God, that's a very big advantage. Then the worship that we do in a temple, the worship that we do in a mosque or a church, that now becomes, uh, you know, that same paradigm is taken to our daily life. So the work that you do in the office, the work that you do at, at home, um, in the community, all of that becomes equal to the worship done in the temple. Now, all that we do, we are doing in life now becomes an act of worship. The kind of uh, the sublime, uh, purifying, ennobling feeling that one gets after a puja or after a session, you know, uh, a ritualistic worship, the same one, perhaps more so, one can get while, you know, writing a letter or uh, talking to a person. This is a philosophy which transforms, which makes spirituality a 24-hour thing. You see, the, otherwise what happens is spirituality is always a losing proposition. Uh, for a person who is working hard in the world, has to take care of a family and obligations to the community and society, there is very little time and energy left over if spirituality is one more add-on. Um, there was a seminar on servant leadership in some uh, corporate um, you know, set up here in the United States. And one objection was, come on, I have all these responsibilities. On top of that, I have to take in this new age stuff. Of, I still have, I have to become a kind of, kind of a spiritual executive. So it's, if you make it an add-on, an extra thing, then spirituality will always be a losing proposition. There will be always be very little time and energy left over for meditation. Uh, there will be very little motivation and energy left over for scriptural study. But if our 24 hours, our work day, our relationships in the family, in the office can be transformed into spiritual practice, then, uh, then spirituality becomes everywhere. Uh, you see, this is a, is a, is a very big uh, insight into how one can make spirituality practical in one's day-to-day -day life. Um, another way, psychologically what it does is, a great deal of our unhappiness especially today, is because of our uh, overwhelming concern with ourselves. So this one, this body, this mind, this is all that is most important. So the problems in this body, the problems in this mind, these are the ones that I have to tackle. This is what I think, wrong. What Karma Yoga teaches us is, is to reverse this, that the problems of this little body and mind um, do not matter. This is this whole world. There are so many people who are suffering. What can I do for them? Swami Ranganathan, uh, he would say that what is spirituality? When I close my eyes, I find peace within. When I open my eyes, my uh, attitude is what can I do for you? So this open my eyes, when you engage with society, what can I do for you? Uh, that is the way to peace. And that is the way to overcome anxiety. Uh, see, no, it's this overwhelming concern with ourselves that leads to more and more, you know, tying ourselves into knots of despair and uh, hopelessness and anxiety. Uh, when my whole attitude is, what can I do for you? Uh, how can I help? And then our own concerns, you know, they, they diminish. This is uh, the, if you look for one central moral principle in all the great traditions of the world, it's what's called the golden, uh, golden rule, that you treat others as you would expect them to treat you. Uh, so instead of expecting and waiting for good treatment for others, we go out there uh, to do as much as we can for others. And miraculously, magically, we find our own despair diminishing. We find our own anxiety for our own sakes diminishing as we are engaged in this kind of action. Yes. I'm going to just interrupt. I think because there are a couple of very sort of crucial uh, uh, issues, issues that you raised. You know, one, of course, is, is, is you know, the obligation to uh, believe in divinity. And, um, you know, what form? So there are two questions that... Uh, is there a secular alternative to this? And uh, the second is that, uh, you know, the nature uh, of that divinity. So Thakur, you know, worshipped uh, uh, Makali. And, and, and even someone like Swamiji, uh, you know, found the experience of a under deep understanding of this true nature of reality 
And so I had to ask Thakur, that give me a glimpse, help me experience it. So, you know, the, 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 the pure, the pure uh, unilateral process uh, was not adequate uh, in order to achieve this all encompassing uh, understanding of reality. So there are really two questions. One is that, uh, you know, the imperative for divinity and the particular form that that divinity should take. And uh, the second is really this aspect, it still needed the intervention of blessing, grace, or you know, however you want to describe it. And whether this aspiration is achievable by unilateral human effort. Mm. That's a very good question. Let me take up the first one. And that's relevant because the moment you say, or somebody says that karma yoga is worship of God in all beings through service. It's a wonderful doctrine, but it's predicated on our <laughs> belief in God. So uh, I remember attending this a wonderful interfaith program many years ago in Nanded, organized by the Sikhs on the 300th anniversary of Gutta Gaddi, you know, where Guru Gobind Singh made the Guru Granth Sahib uh, the, uh, take the place of the uh, Guru. Uh, so there were all these uh, theistic traditions, uh, uh, you know, Christians, and there was a rabbi from New York, actually, who had gone to Nanded, and uh, the Sikhs themselves talking about God and the worship of God. And there was this whole, uh, there was a group of three or four um, lamas who had been sent by his holiness. So they were sitting at the back and smiling sweetly because from their tradition, talking about God and worship of God is not relevant. There, there is no particular ultimate transcendent deity whom we are supposed to worship. Um, so this question arises. We'll take it up a little more later when we come to Jnana Yoga. But right now, Karma Yoga, the Bhagavad Gita kind, where Karma Yoga is the worship of God. Uh, you dedicate all your actions to God. But then when you look at Karma Yoga, when Swami Vivekananda talks about it, he al also talks about Karma Yoga without any reference to God. Then why do you do good if it's not a worship of God? In Swami Vivekananda's restatement of Karma Yoga, it is good to do good because it is good. Just the fact that it is good is enough reason to do good. I am reminded of Bodhicharya Avatar, of uh, Shantideva. One should remove suffering because it is suffering. The suffering in this body and mind and the suffering in that body and mind are non-distinct. If I instinctively move to remove suffering in this body and mind, why would I not do so for uh, the suffering in all bodies and mind? You can see immediately here, it's a restatement of the golden rule that you do unto others as you would have them do, do to you. In fact, here in the United Nations, if you go in the building and the headquarters building here, the golden rule is written in, in carved into rock. And so that's sort of the basic moral principle of all the common moral principle of all religious traditions of the world, theistic and non-theistic. So yes, one can, to answer your question directly, one can do karma yoga without any reference to a deity and the worship of uh, a reference to a belief in God. If does, one does have belief in God, that makes it all the more sweeter uh, because now you are working for something or somebody you love intensely. Um, sort of interrupt, yes. uh, you know, as, 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 as clarification on, on, on my thought, uh, a thought on uh, uh, Shantideva. I think what Shantideva was uh, also implicitly pointing to and uh, was that uh, not of suffering per se, but of the suffering of suffering. I think that's a, that's a crucial uh, distinction. And the second one really was that what do we mean by doing good? And is it just in the doing or is it in the intention of the motivation? Because very often we can we confront moral dilemmas as to is this action good uh, in, in the doing? And so it becomes the when, when an enhanced idea of the bodhisattva. And I mean, sort of I believe that Swamiji was a bodhisattva. And, and that was that the motivation uh, of his actions uh, was altruistic. And again, sort of you know, looking at the self that all these traditions are really looking to soften uh, our sense of the self, uh, so that the self that suffers is no longer as obsessed 
with the I, me, mine, and it begins to look at the, at the other as oneself. And hence this the philosophical framework of uh, interdependence, that we are all interdependent on each other. And so our acts of altruism uh, are actually also helping us. So it's, you know, uh, being wisely selfish uh, in, 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 in many ways. And, and while you're on, 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 on karma yoga, it, it, it is an aspect of our tradition uh, that, uh, that it, it is also a liability to recognize. I'm just talking about the idea of karma while we're on karma yoga. And uh, so before we move on, and uh, is that, you know, we often think that our suffering or our experience of the suffering of suffering has to do with past actions. And uh, so... Uh, you know, studies have been done to say that people from, you know, our traditions are able to surrender uh, our experience of suffering to say, this is karma. And so it becomes easier for me to deal with it uh, than to, uh, and, and a karma of past life, so what can I do? I just need to let it unfold. So it is this, this struggle to find the impulse to do what you suggest, and which is the right thing to do, uh, you know, plainly, or the best thing uh, in our, uh, our self-interest and collective interest. And yet, that impulse is often elusive. Good. You've raised so many points, I'm now beginning to write it down. <laughs> so, uh, all right. First, uh, the bodhisattva aspect of it, I also, I think, uh, Swamiji was in the classic archetype of a bodhisattva. In fact, Swami Vivekananda himself said, what, what did he want to do? What was he doing? What was his mission? He says, my mission in life can be put in a few words. It is to preach unto humanity their inner divinity and how to make it manifest in every movement of life. He said, my goal, um, he said, is to, is to do this, is to preach their inner divinity um, until the whole universe shall know it is one with God. Now, you see, this is the same motivation which makes the Bodhisattva uh, work lifetime after lifetime, not so much for his or her own enlightenment and liberation, but for all, uh, you know, the enlightenment of all. The enlightenment of all may not be a practical goal to be reached in a set number of lifetimes, but the motivation is important. What are we here for? What are we doing? So yes, uh, Swami Vivekananda, the Bodhisattva, definitely. Um, when we come to karma yoga, immediately as you, you discern that behind it all lies this idea of karma. And uh, I, um, we talked about our traditions, which means the Indic traditions, which are all karma based. For a moment, just stop and think how basic this idea of karma is to all Indian thought. Um, one monk in the uh, in Uttarakhand in, in the Himalayas pointed out that uh, that among all the Indian traditions, no matter how different they are, they all accept karma. That monk said, "Ye karma baad bahut gambhir tattva hai Mahatma ji." This <laughs> this doctrine of karma is a very profound doctrine. You have Buddhists who do not believe in God. You have Hindus who are by and large theistic. They believe in God. You have Jainas who, uh, do not, uh, who are not theistic. Um, you have Sikhs who are deeply theistic. And all of these Indic traditions, they firmly accept karma. And the curious thing is, on this side of the world, when I talk about, if I talk about karma and reincarnation, uh, let's set, set, set aside something like reincarnation, which is difficult to uh, accept here. Even karma, I am still puzzled why people here are puzzled about karma. Because it is so axiomatic to our way of thinking. After all, what is karma? It's causality. It's causality applied to human life. Is there an element of faith involved? There is, but it seems pretty reasonable. Um, if you do not apply cause and effect, that actions have consequences. If you do not apply that, then everything becomes sort of random and meaningless. So it's a pretty reasonable doctrine to accept that things uh, are, uh, actions have consequences, causes have effects. Now, one way of, you know, a wrong way of looking at it would be, 
So whatever I'm doing here has been produced by my past actions and what, what can I do about it? A fatalistic approach. Swami Vivekananda was strongly against that kind of interpretation of karma. He had a very positive approach to, to karma. He said, what we are today is what we have made of ourselves. And what we do now goes to determine what we will be in, in future. So therefore, karma is basically free will. It's not something that limits free will. Practically, it may seem to do so, but it is the exercise of free will leading to this. We make literally make our own destiny, not as a matter of rhetoric, not as something nice to believe, but that's what's going on all the time. Um, we have spun this web in which we find ourselves trapped right now. All right. Now, what do we do in karma yoga? This doing good. What uh, is it just the removal? What kind of suffering are you working to remove? Um, Swami, for I mean, the question is like this. People are hungry or people are sick. Is that the suffering you're trying to remove? Or if you look at Vedanta, Buddhism, they would say the root of all suffering is ignorance of our real nature. And are you working to remove that? Somebody might say that uh, I am not really uh, you know, engaged with the surface symptoms. I'm going to the root of the disease and I'm trying to uh, remove that. The problem with that is, then you will have, uh, as Swami Vivekananda saw, thousands of monks who are studying Vedanta, uh, but completely unconcerned about the state of society around them. Why the state of society? Completely unconcerned about the well-being of the monks around them also. Because it's all their karma. What can I do? Uh, I have to go to the root of it all and remove ignorance and realize I am Brahman and teach everybody that they are Brahman. So what should be the um, uh, ideal? I think it's the whole spectrum. It's an attitude that I will work to remove the suffering of all beings. What suffering? All suffering. Wherever I can, in whatever way I can. If there's, as Swami Vivekananda said, um, that medicine and nursing for the sick, food for the hungry, uh, education for the uh, uh, illiterate, and spiritual knowledge for those who are seeking it, definitely. Not just spiritual knowledge or not just social service. Uh, it's the whole spectrum. Um, should we move on to the next yoga? Because before, yes. Uh, please move on. because <laughs> Be Before this, you asked another question, which was a prompt for me to move on to bhakti yoga, because you talked about this enlightenment, which we are seeking. Is it possible to attain it without grace, without, uh, you know, some, without the direct experience of the divinity? And that requires grace or not. So I think this is a good prompt to move on to another yoga, a very different approach to spiritual life. Here, of course, it is primarily theistic, but not entirely, because uh, it would be wrong to say it, that, uh, say, in a non-theistic tradition like Buddhism, especially in a Mahayana tradition like Tibetan Buddhism, it would be wrong to say that there is no devotion, there is no bhakti. No, there is. There is a great cultivation of uh, emotions and devotion uh, to the various deities. Um, bhakti yoga, what it does is that it, it, of course, depends on faith. So bhakti yoga is primarily a path of faith. In bhakti yoga, you cannot come in and say from the very beginning that you, you cannot come in like Christopher Hitchens or Richard Dawkins with a skeptical attitude, then it won't work. Bhakti yoga starts with a belief or a faith that God exists, God is attainable, uh, and in, in fact, most worthy of pursuing God realization. We have the ability uh, to love. Normally what happens is this power is scattered in a thousand different streams. It flows out into the world as desire. I want this, that, and the other thing. Then only I will be happy. Adi Shankaracharya, he says that, uh, you know, his favorite phrase, avidya kama karma. Uh, so um, our Deep ignorance of our real nature as Brahman, that we are already infinite and full. We don't know that. We see ourselves as uh, incomplete. As we see ourselves as incomplete, there arises karma, desire. And as we pursue desires, trying to fulfill desires, we engage in action, karma, karma prompted by desire. And that leads to consequences and we are immediately trapped in this cycle of karma. So ignorance, desire and karma. Now, what bhakti yoga does is it comes in between here 
that desire which flows in a hundred different streams to the world. I want all these things and then I'll be happy. It doesn't work. It's entirely wrong. Even if I get all of that, I will still be dissatisfied. I mean, the richest person. I mean, here I'll say that I had a very interesting experience in the last few years. Uh, I was in a Hollywood, three interesting places I lived in. I was in Hollywood for a year. And then I'm here in, in Manhattan, close to Wall Street. And then I was at Harvard for one year in Boston. Now, you see, there are these three ways of becoming happy. These, these three places, they have a principle behind them. Hollywood is about glamour and popularity and who is famous. You, if you are close to the movie industry in Hollywood, you are supposed to be, you have supposed to be made it, you know, you're supposed to be happy. If you are here in Manhattan, here in near Wall Street, it's not so much being famous as being rich. If you are a billionaire, you have made it. Money is important here. And in, uh, when I went to Boston and stayed at Harvard, there it's not so much money. There's a lot of money there, by the way. It's the richest university in the world. But it's not so much money. It's learning. Uh, and it's you know, the cultivation of, of scholarship. So if you're the head of the department, if you're the Nobel Prize winner, you're at the top of the food chain and so on. Does it work? What I was interested in was, does it work? Does fame and glamour, does it really make you happy? Does money make you happy? Does, um, you know, scholarship and... The answer is it depends. These are all like zeros. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, no matter how many zeros you collect, you end up with zero. But if you have the one, then all the zeros add value to it. The one is, of course, spirituality of any what, in whatever form. It could be bhakti, it could be um, knowledge, it could be meditation, it could be altruistic action, it could be Buddhism, Hinduism, whatever it is. So I found that those people who had some form of uh, deep spirituality in them, some any form, to that they added glamour or uh, money or uh, learning, and that was fine. But those who did not, for them it didn't work. Uh, but no matter how glamorous you are and famous you are, no matter how rich you are or learned you are, it does not lead to any lasting satisfaction. So what bhakti does is it takes all of these desires and focuses it on the ultimate reality, on God. So instead of loving the world, we love God. Do we hate the world? Do we become indifferent to the world? No. You see God in everybody. Swami Vivekananda he says that uh, the he who runs away from this world to meditate and die in a Himalayan cave has missed the way. The he who plunges headlong into the vanities of the world has also missed the way. Then what is the way? The way is to see God in everything. This is to deify life itself. Who you are with, where you are, there you see God in every, everybody. So the love of God and the love of all beings through God, in and through God, that is Bhakti Yoga. And once that comes, when love comes into the heart, then you will see, see, I'm trying to answer your original question here. Anxiety, depression, helplessness, meaninglessness, and all of that disappears. Love is probably the noblest, the most sublime of all human emotions. Any kind of love, even human love, um, any kind of human love you have in the world, a personal one-to-one -one relationship, when there's a genuine feeling of love, you see, it tends to, at least psychologically, uh, all problems sort of diminish. They pale in, in front of the, the, the glory, the glow of love. Now imagine that love collected from the world and given to the divine. Uh, human love often leads to, almost inevitably leads to uh, frustration and unhappiness, but love given to God does not. So bhakti yoga, when love arises in the heart, uh, it can overcome meaninglessness, it can overcome anxiety very easily. So that's the second yoga. There, of course, God is central. You can't start off by doubting God. Uh, there, uh, faith is central. Grace of God is central. This is the other question which you asked. We depend on the grace of God. But Sri Ramakrishna said, the winds of grace are ever blowing. You raise your sail. Remember, he used to live near a river, the Hugli, which is basically the Ganga. So you would see these little boats sailing up and down the river. And he would notice the boatman who raised his sails skillfully. He caught the wind which was blowing and effortlessly he sailed up and down the river. Similarly, the wind of grace is always blowing. But you raise your sails to catch that, to take, take advantage of the grace of God. Before you move That's on. Yes. 
I'm going to interrupt you again uh, because there are two sort of interesting things because we have been cross-referencing uh, Buddhism uh, is that, uh, and I think that uh, many people from outside our traditions find the idea of uh, uh, locking in a divinity problematic. And so I think the Buddhist solution was that we create our own gods out of Shunya. And so does God exist? Uh, who is God? Uh, is a question that is ducked. Uh, and so by creating a god out of Shunya, uh, Buddhists are able to practice all the elements and the stages that you're talking about. And so the god becomes real during the time of uh, practice uh, to, to, to impact one. And at, at some point, as, as you know, time races by and you, you, know, you have some, two yogas to cover, uh, is that uh, I think that you know, we, we, we frequently refer to enlightenment. And uh, so you know, the question often begs itself, what is enlightenment? Uh, uh, and, and I think that uh, in my sort of my struggles uh, as, as, as a student, uh, and I sort of followed the, the idea that these are non conceptual experiences, which are very difficult to articulate. And in my own struggles uh, in, 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 in meditation, you perhaps have a little time for Raj Yoga. Uh, whenever I have tried to articulate and explain it, my teachers have discouraged me from doing so, so that you don't get frozen in the concept of it, but are able to aspire to the experience of it. So when you hold forth the ideal of enlightenment as the destination of all of this, uh, what do we say to our brothers and sisters, including me, that enlightenment is? We may be able to say what it may do for us, I don't know. So please weave that in. Uh, I think that's a very important uh, because it remains ambiguous and fuzzy as some kind of, you know, blissed out or from Timothy Leary, what people did with psychedelics and they had these experiences or whatever it was. So what is this thing that we're aspiring to that everybody talks about? Right. That gives me the perfect cue to move into Jnana Yoga, actually, which is really uh, my favorite, as people might guess from <laughs> most of my talks. <laughs> so uh, I'll spend some time on that before we briefly touch upon Raja Yoga. Now, from a Jnana Yoga perspective, it is in some sense the polar opposite of the Bhakti Yoga perspective. Remember, we are all moving towards that same reality, whether through Bhakti or Jnana. But what the Jnana Yoga does is, it does not expect us to start with faith in a deity, faith in God. Uh, it says, just look at your own experience. It's easy to, it's interesting to contrast, say, the mystical yogic path with the uh, path of philosophy or knowledge or the jnani's path. What is the contrast? The yogic path, in contrast to the bhakti path, says that, no, 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 not faith, experience. So, um, you, like Vivekananda was the classic yogi, he goes to Sri Ramakrishna and says that, can I see God? Vivekananda used to say, if I have an immortal soul, I must feel it. If God exists, I must be able to see God. Now, what's underlying that? It's the cry for experience. And that's peculiarly the spirit of our age. It's not really an age of faith. It's too late and, uh, in the day to demand unquestioning faith. But experience is what people would uh, you know, they would, you know, as you said, Timothy Leary and others, uh, even in their wildest uh, uh, experiments, what they were looking for was experience, mystical experience. In contrast to the yogis' search for mystical experience to confirm the truths, or the cl truth claims of religion, in contrast to that, is now we have a third approach: bhakti approach, yogic approach, the jnani approach. The jnani approach is. Not mystical experience, mystical experience also, but more importantly, ordinary, quotidian experience, our day-to-day -day life. The big advantage here is if you claim mystical experience, the problem is mystical experience is not shared by everybody. 
And a neuroscientist might come along and say that, uh, I have no doubt that you are experiencing it, but it's being caused by the drugs that are in your system that you are you know, stimulating your brain cells, or it's a little stroke you have on one side of your brain, and that's why you're getting this. A neuroscientist will immediately come and give his version of an old objection. What Sri Ramakrishna faced was exactly the same thing. This, there was a group of people who said, he's mad. He's just a madman. So uh, the madman argument is basically translates into our 21st century neuroscience argument against the reality of spirituality, that it's something in your brain. And that's why you feel you're perceiving it, but it's not true. It's not true because it's not shared. Whereas common day-to-day experience is shared. This is the, the elegant and powerful approach of Jnana Yoga. It says, forget mystical experience. Take your day-to-day experience, by which I mean the experience of waking, dreaming, deep sleep. I, by which I mean the experience of this, the basic structure of all experience, subject and object, drashta and drishya. Or just the experience of being this sentient being, a physical existence, annamaya, uh, a pranic existence, pranamaya, mental, uh, you experience your own mind, manomaya, experience the intellect, the vijnanamaya. And the blankness beyond the intellect, the anandamaya, just these experiences, which everybody has, is just a human being, you have these experiences. And what jnana yoga does is, it takes just these experiences available to everybody, and then leads us step by step to see the reality behind them. The reality which, um, through and in which we, ex- we have these experiences. And that reality is... Um, in Vedantic terms, Advaitic terms, is pure awareness or pure consciousness, uh, chit, um, or which is synonymous with pure being, uh, sat, which is synonymous with pure bliss, ananda, sat, chit, ananda, which is existence itself, consciousness itself, bliss itself. Here you will see, um, speaking to what you said, a difficulty of articulating it, we are already using words like sat, chit, ananda, pure being, pure awareness, pure consciousness. This is not a normal way of speaking. I mean, I can talk about a pen and paper and a cloth. These are things which exist. But if you say existence itself, what does it mean? We're already talking in metaphysical terms. And that's unavoidable because language was not meant to deal with uh, this reality, the, uh, the ultimate reality. Uh, language comes much later. It's meant to deal with this world of uh, our experience. But nevertheless, because it is our own reality, because it is self-luminous, it, it, it shines forth. In Upanishadic language, um, that shining, everything else shines. By its light, everything is here is lit up. Tameva bhantam anubhati sarvam tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati kat Upanishad. Because it's self-revealing, It's not that it cannot be known without articulation. Uh, Even if you cannot express it in language, it's still evident. So what Vedanta does is, it takes up these um, uh, experiences which are available to everybody. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep. The Mandukya Upanishad, you're taken to the background awareness of all of this, the Turiya. Uh, In the Drik Drishya Viveka, you analyze your experience of uh, seeing and uh, the seer and the seen. And then you go back to the ultimate seer, the witness consciousness, or the Panchakosha Viveka of Taittiriya Upanishad, where you, exp- you just start with the body. And step by step, at each point, nothing that is not available for public ex- for your own experience, uh, the prana, the mind, the intellect, which is admitted by everybody. And using this alone, the path of knowledge says that I can show you your own real nature, which is pure consciousness, pure existence, pure bliss, and it, it can be demonstrated to your entire satisfaction. And at that point, it is an entirely unproblematic existence. So from at least from your perspective, you have solved all problems. Because, for example, that reality does not die. So your greatest problem, the fear of death, uh, our fear of uh, um, eventual dissolution, that goes away. That uh, being, that awareness is not subject to old age or disease. So that problem drops away. That uh, awareness is not subject to the ups and downs of the mind. The mind can go through ups and downs. It can even be anxious. And you know, deep within, you are all right. So from at least the personal level of the enlightened person, uh, the all problems 
are uh, solved forever by this insight. This insight is called enlightenment. I just like to add here, um, all of this will sound a little, you know, it can make a Mahayanist, especially a Tibetan Buddhist, a um, little queasy and uneasy. And talk, all, all this talk about ultimate realities and uh, pure consciousness and pure being, it seems like, you know, the, the bugbear of, uh, uh, of Tibetan Buddhism, the reification problem. But actually it isn't. Uh, I'll refer a book which I read recently, um, Prog- Meditation and Progressive Stages of uh, Emptiness, um, where the concept of shunyata is analyzed, uh, is explained in five stages, starting with the, uh, the Shravakayana, the, the, the Theravada understanding of shunyata, uh, then moving on to the Chitta Matra, the mind only school of uh, the mind only school understanding of shunyata then moving on to the uh, madhyamaka and then also there the swatantrika and the prasangika madhyamaka understanding of shunyata and then to a little known uh, aspect of tibetan buddhism which is the shentong approach which is they talk about pure awareness which is so advaitic so there i see uh, that they, the two traditions meet uh, the two traditions are clearly different. It's like climbing up the same mountain from different paths, but they do come together. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, Swamiji, that you know, we're running out of time, but you have to you have to give us a a, a, a flavor of uh, Raj Yoga, and I, I will just sort of uh, point to uh, a few things that uh, you know came up for me. And I think that the aspiration of all the different religious traditions and approaches, whether it is Buddhism or Advaita uh, or uh, Bhakti or Islam or what have you, is really, is it useful uh, to the individual uh, so that he can find, for want of a better word, happiness. We use happiness with uh, uh, (laughs) a great sort of uh, reservation because there is a whole American concept of happiness. And you talked about happiness in uh, Hollywood, New York, and uh, Boston as being different kinds of aspirations. So whatever it may be, call it equanimity or what have you. So is it useful? And, uh, and I think that, uh, that, that softens the fragmentation and the divide, that my way or the highway. So if I find a particular view of Shunya or a particular view of the divine useful, so be it. And I think that that was what, uh, in my limited understanding, uh, Thakur's aspiration was when he did the, the different sadhanas. He was demonstrating that each one of them had a place, Dwight, Tadwai, Tantra, Islam, whatever it was. And I think it, it's extremely important uh, that that message goes out into the world today, uh, that uh, this is what we find useful, but you might find something else useful. And that there are some common parameters, uh, such as you have mentioned, uh, altruism, compassion, concern uh, for the others. But, uh, you know, time is running out, so but it, you, you'll have to be brief. But uh, uh, there is so much learning from you that this should have been a six-hour session <laughs> instead of a, a modest, uh, you know, one hour. Uh, you know, as, as, as and I always sort of describe myself as a str- struggling aspirant, far away from understanding the truth. In a sense, it is Raja Yoga, which is the most sort of, uh, uh, in some ways, uh, the most detailed articulation of technique or practice. I mean, all of it is practice. Much more, uh, uh, how to put it, you know, structured, tangible uh, uh, process. So uh, a, a quick overview of the, the practices of Raja Yoga, uh, you know, for us, uh, you know, uh, Yes, I'm yes. Uh, I understand. You know, sometimes we're thinking that we say so many things. Is it, uh, there's an American, very useful American term, the takeaway. So, <laughs> what is the takeaway from all this? Can, can we actually have it in one word, not even one sentence? And yes, the takeaway from this is what is useful in all of this? In one word, in karma yoga, what is useful is selflessness, not selfishness selflessness that works in bhakti yoga love not desire that works that's useful uh, in jnana yoga self knowledge not other knowledge uh, so that's what is uh, being taught here and that's useful in raja yoga or dhyana yoga the way of meditation 
one word, focus, not distraction. You want to take away one word, that's focus. Uh, it, I think that word encompasses all of uh, Raja Yoga. It's basically the training of attention. Um, we had a session on meditation, a, a whole retreat on meditation a couple of years ago at the Garrison Institute in upstate New York. And uh, um, we reflected on different traditions of meditation. Meditation in Kashmir Shaivism, the mindfulness Buddhist meditation technique, the dualistic bhakti tradition of meditating on your beloved deity, and the Raj and the Vedantic tradition of Nididhyasana, Vedantic that Aham Brahma asked me to reflect on that, stay with that. But what was common to all of them? Uh, we found what was common to all of them was the training of attention. And this, I, I don't need to go into it right now, but this is very much needed, especially in, in societies like this. It's a very distracted society. Attention is the most important currency, which it's, I, I mean, it's not Vedanta, which is just saying it, or Buddhism, or uh, Patanjali Yoga. Uh, it is Wall Street and Silicon Valley, which is saying it. Now they talk about the attention economy. They're all out to grab your attention, uh, because that translates into money for them. Training of the attention, conserving an attention. It's the most precious thing that we have in, in life. Uh, that is um, Raja Yoga. And Patanjali's Yoga Sutras is probably the most ancient manual of meditation. Just by the way, you talked about the medicinal practices which you'll be taking up. And I was thinking how interesting. Patanjali, in our tradition, uh, the Rishi, the sage Patanjali is supposed to be the source of three kinds of medicine. Medicine for the body, Ayurveda. So Patanjali is a great contributor to Ayurveda. Then medicine for the speech, for correcting wrong speech. Patanjali is famously known as the great commentator on Panini's uh, uh, sutras on Sanskrit grammar, the, the author of the Mahabhashya. So he corrects wrong speech, medicine for the speech. And medicine for the mind, the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, which is the manual of uh, meditation. Yeah, so this is what I wanted to say. Uh, we'll, uh, you know, I, the temptation to keep you here uh, all morning and all evening for us is, 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 is huge, but I guess we have to be uh, considerate and, and pray very hard that uh, you, we will have you back for what really is just, uh, you know, feels like an appetizer, uh, given your vast erudition, wisdom and experience. Uh, it's over to Aparna. Uh, we have about 10, 15, 10 minutes. Uh, so we've already, you know, sort of kept Swamiji here for far longer than we had promised him he had the day to go ahead. Uh, so a quick set of questions, and then I will just do a, a, a word of thanks at the end. Over to you, Aparna. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have lots of questions for you, Swamiji, but um, in the interest of saving uh, time, I'm going to try and stay with questions that, you know, pertain more to what we spoke about already today. Uh, so there's um, one question from Dr. Vani Bajpai, uh, who wants to understand a little more about the idea of karma. Uh, and I think in the, you know, the, what we discussed right now as well was that, you know, I mean, there are different ways to look at karma, but essentially it is cause and effect. Uh, but I think in the way in which it is commonly perceived or popularly perceived, um, it's almost like, you know, it's a little stick that somebody is holding, you know, to keep everybody in check, you know, so when something bad happens to someone, you know, we say, oh, that's the karma speaking, you know, or, or if something bad happens to us, we're like, oh, what bad karmas did we do for us to have to go through whatever we're going through, right? So if you could speak a little more about the idea of karma and how perhaps we can take away this uh, disciplinarian sort of, you know, imagination that we seem to have about karma and, and to take it back to the space of cause and effect. Right. I'll just say one thing here. Um, Swami Vivekananda, he used karma in a very positive sense. As I said, it is what we have made of ourselves. So if it is their bad karma that somebody else is suffering, then it's your karma to help that person. So karma is used in two senses, in the sense of what we do and in the sense of the results of what we have done. So if somebody is suffering, you can't dismiss it by saying it's bad karma. It is your karma now to help. Um, uh, you know, when this group of people, the Cow Protection Society, came to Swami Vivekananda and asked for his help in uh, protecting uh, uh, cows. And he said, it's a noble uh, cause, but I will first um, work for the suffering humanity. Uh, how about people in your province, they are, at that time, they're suffering from famine. 
And those gentlemen said, quite unconcerned, they said, oh, it's their bad karma. And Swami Vivekananda was furious at this. He said, if it is their bad karma to suffer, uh, it's your karma to help. So, yes, that would be my basic answer to this. <laughs> I'd like to add to that. I think that uh, in, in contemporary uh, vocabulary, uh, karma is seen as the imprints in our consciousness, the motivations behind our actions, which create predispositions for subsequent actions and our subsequent experience, as Swamiji so eloquently uh, explained, the subsequent uh, engagement with what unfolds in our lives. So uh, no karma is good or bad uh, per se. If you look at it in the larger context, that the objective of uh, you know, the human condition uh, is to go through a process of evolution through life's experiences so that we attain nirvana or enlightenment. So if, if we can begin to look at karma like that, it will soften our sense of karma being good, bad, or a judgment on who we are today uh, based on what we were in the past. And also that causality is, you know, karma, karmic causality is often mistaken as being singular, that I do X and so Y follows. It is an accumulation, a cross-fertilization of different intentions in which when they, fr when they fructify in action, they become much more intense. <laughs> okay. uh, we have another interesting question from Robert, who asks that, you know, I mean, if, if this is, uh, 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 you know, a world of illusion that we're living, you know, everything is, then is not uh, the decision to seek enlightenment just another form of that illusion? You know, we replace other desires with the desire to get enlightened. Absolutely. But this is what will be called a skillful means. See, the basic fact is we are suffering. If we were not suffering, everything was perfect, then there would be no need to seek for anything else. But things are not perfect. And things have not worked out for us even after lifetimes of effort. So here is this, uh, this promise that you can solve these problems. The Indologist Heinrich Zimmer said, contrary to appearances, the philosophies of India are entirely uh, optimistic. They, they sound pessimistic, but they are optimistic because they say that a solution to the human condition is possible. The solution to the human problem is possible. So um, we, we can uh, go beyond suffering. Uh, this is the promise. Yes. I think that, you know, sorry, I'm marching in too much, but I think this issue of uh, is an illusion, I think is, is, is perhaps an incorrect uh, uh, use of... Uh, uh, the, the language. And I think that Buddhism is attempting to explain it by the idea of shunya. And shunya is often confused with emptiness or the absence of, uh, of all matter or all dimensions of reality. I think what we're really saying is, is to soften our sense of grasping, to, be, to suggest that everything is dynamic, it is not frozen, it is dependent on dynamic causes and conditions. So when we grasp at something as having a immutable, independent existence, we suffer because it is in a constant sense of change uh, and is constantly dynamic. So I think it is because we misunderstand that and we certainly don't experience it. Certainly I don't experience it uh, in, in, in the realm of realization and only see it as knowledge that I struggle with the sense of duality. And it is really the, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, the Dwight and Advait, the dual and non-dual, and this is how they, they address this problem. And again, we you know, use whichever of the two philosophies uh, we relate to emotionally and intellectually. Um, and even if you consider the nature of illusion itself, suppose you say it's all illusion, but what is an illusion? If you're talking about an illusion, then you must talk about reality also. It is the reality appearing otherwise, which is called an illusion. In Shankaracharya's language, atasmin tad buddhi. What is not there, you see there. There is no snake there. It's a rope, but you see a snake there. But if you're seeing a snake, if that's an illusion, if somebody comes and points out to you, that's an illusion, immediately you're going to ask them, what's the truth? So wherever there is an illusion, wherever there is an appearance, there must be reality. So if this world is an appearance, then there must be reality. And where is this reality? Where there is the illusion. 
So if the snake is an illusion and the rope is the reality, you can ask the question, where is the rope? There itself. What you are seeing as the snake is actually a rope. What we are seeing as the world is actually Brahman. That is basically the essence of Advaita Vedanta. So the moment, if you say it's all illusion, great. That means you are actually in the presence of reality. You are in the presence, you are immersed in reality. That transition from not recognizing reality to recognizing reality uh, is uh, enlightenment. Right. Um, another very interesting question from Pema, who asks that sometimes, you know, if you think you're on the spiritual path, uh, there is a tendency to start judging those who are not, because I think somewhere you begin to think that you're superior to others who are still, you know, sort of in constant, um, uh, in, in illusion and mind, and you have somehow, you know, begun to see the true nature of reality and you think you're superior to them. And that again is just an example of the ego sort of, you know, coming in. So how, what would you sort of say to that? How would you respond to that? Don't worry about it and don't judge. <laughs> uh, because the person, all the other person, the moment you see this true nature of reality that all is Brahman, I am Brahman and all is Brahman, then the persons you are judging are Brahman. Are you judging Brahman? Are you judging God? No. <laughs> so don't. Just give it up. And don't worry too much about it also. <laughs> yeah, you know, again, this this really is a question of, uh, uh, how do I put it, in, 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 in Buddhist terms, when we don't look at a kind of, uh, when, when you start looking at Atman and you start looking at uh, the flow of Atman as a, a, a single singular flow, as opposed to more universal consciousness. So I think that the, the different traditions have evolved in different ways to meet different uh, cultural, social, psychological needs. And so it's important that we don't get locked in, into the certitude of our particular uh, perspective and point of view. And, and I think that will help diminish the ego that we are somehow superior to the other person. Because I'm sure that it is possible for someone who is agnostic, atheist, and has never done a day's practice or meditation in their lives to be perfectly good, compassionate, altruistic, good human beings. And it's extremely important that we, we recognize this. Right. We have another question from uh, Vivek Mittal. And he asks, is there any one particular question that we can ask ourselves every day to keep us on the path to enlightenment? I mean, for a Vedantist, that's very easy. Who am I? <laughs> but in, ter <laughs> in, in terms of uh, the practices we talked about, that's a good question. Let me put it in terms of four questions. Am I centered in the who am I? Or am I just scattered in the world outside in the other? That's one. Am I focused or distracted? Am I loving or desiring? Uh, am I selfish or selfless? These four questions. Right. Uh, there's one more question again from Dr. Uh, Vani Bajpai, uh, who's asking whether we should exhaust our existing vasanas or should we replace them with better ones? Oh, always replace them. That, that is the skillful way of doing it. You cannot exhaust vasanas. This is a very ancient and common understanding to all the Indian traditions. It's like the classic example of pouring ghee on a blazing fire. So a fire is blazing and you want to put it out and you try to douse it by pouring fuel into it, ghee into it. It will blaze even further. So this was an understanding which came through thousands of years of you know, reflection on the human condition. Can we fulfill all our desires by keeping on fulfilling desires? We cannot. Uh, yeah, and I just let, let's look at our, our lives. You know, when you are 20 years old or 40 or 60 or 80 years old, we have tried to be happy by fulfilling our desires till this point. Have we succeeded? No, it doesn't work. Well, I have to thank uh, uh, Swamiji, uh, not merely for uh, uh, be, being, being so very articulate, uh, but for who you are. Because I think that we have learned so much uh, from who you are and, 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 and how you have expressed who you are. Because uh, ultimately, it is very easy uh, to go through the rhetoric of spirituality. Uh, but uh, you uh, embody it uh, so eloquently. And uh, uh, I think that 
picking up from where you're located in Manhattan, and, and, and I have lived there, uh, I just want to end with a quote from the, the Gita, which says, uh, yoga is not for him who eats too much, nor for him who eats too little. It is not for him, O Arjuna, who sleeps too much, nor for him who sleeps too little, for whom is temperate in his food and recreation, temperate in his exertion at work, temperate in sleep and waking. Yoga puts an end to all sorrow. So I think we need to be temperate in our sadhanas uh, because uh, you know, we, have, uh, we have seen so many people victim uh, to intemperance and in practice and, and suddenly everything collapses. And then the, you know, sort of the, 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 the journey uh, is uh, abandoned and, and rejected. And, and I think that is that polarization uh, happens uh, you know, uh, uh, so often uh, because we sometimes try too hard. And as I began this discussion, that uh, I was seeking from you uh, an instant solution, an instant answer. And I think we, what we have learned so much from you in, in the measured, patient way uh, that you have shared your wisdom uh, is that um, practice is not just in talking, discussing, or debating, but doing. It is in the doing, and the secret of all doing is just to do. And thank you for showing us uh, so many parts. And I mean, I will just close with a request to say, I hope that we will have you back amidst us uh, for a more extended conversation. And uh, thank you very much, Samiji. And as, as, as I started this discussion, uh, it has meant so much to me personally, going back to my own roots and youth uh, with uh, Swami Ranganathan and the that I have been able to learn so much from you. And it, it almost seems as his voice resonates uh, through you. Thank you. This is been Thank a, you for having me. And this is a delight. And we'll do it again. We'll do it again sometime. Great blessing. And uh, thank you all uh, for being a part of this uh, journey of us. Good morning. Good night. <laughs> thank you.